can preach to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. oh neighbor, oh, neighbor. The, power of the, the power of the resurrection. Amen. I know we don't like to engage our neighbor so much, but for just that one moment, permit me to allow you to join me in the preaching of God's word. Amen. As I grew up as a kid, there were a few days that I used to look forward to most um, in my upbringing. And sadly, none of them was my birthday uh, because in my family, we have never had a culture of celebrating birthdays. Um, it, it's not a big deal. You were born today. Oh, that's nice. It, it's never a big deal. The first time I ever had my birthday celebrated was when I turned 21 in the Christian Union at KU and I had some friends who had a room, it was my birthday, and they did something to me. Um, but I used to look forward to four days, and one of them was what we used to call Moi Day, and then there was Kenyatta Day, and there was Madaraka Day and Jamhuri Day. These four days used to excite me, not so much because we would close school and go home, but because I looked forward to especially watch the army doing their thing in Nyan Stadium. We didn't have a TV then, but we had a neighbor who had the small Great Wall TV. It was red in color and black and white. Anybody remember? And we were so excited. The, our neighbor would open the doors for us on these days. And I used to be so inspired watching the army. I loved how they were watching meticulously with the white gloves and how they would pull the gun and how they would about turn. And, and that used to excite me. I loved watching our jet fighters do the stunts they do on the air. And then there would be a chopper that would be flying low with a banner written, God bless Kenya. I was deeply inspired by those things as a young child that when I was growing up, I used to dream and desire to join the military. So much so, and when I knew the military would come in a long while, when I went to school, I became a scout because I wanted to also march, and it filled me with so much pride. We, we live near a barracks where I come from, so we have had the privilege of watching the recruits being trained in the morning, carrying the loads, and for some reason, that used to motivate me. And I used to say, when I grow up, I want to be a man of the uniform in the military, and when I grew up and realized my chances of joining the militaries were somehow vertically challenged, <laughs> I somehow started wishing that I would join the, the military as a chaplain. <laughs> but these four days used to fill me with a lot of excitement. I used to feel proud for my country. I still do. To this date, I am very patriotic when there is, it's just that now when you become a pastor, you can't go to some of these places. Uh, but, but, but there was a lot of inspiration I got from these dates. So much so that in 2020, when we lost our former president, His Excellency Daniel Toroy, teacher of Moi, I was so affected. I took a bus from Ruiru where I stayed. I came to Nairobi, alighted at Kencom, found my way to Harambe Avenue, office of the president. And I said to the guard at the gate, I have come to give my condolences <laughs> to the former president. And they allowed me in and I signed the book of condolence. <laughs> And I love my country. I want my country to succeed. Sometime, not so long ago, we were here. That time, I used to be in the Sitam Joint Choir, and we were here for a practice for one of our annual conferences. And just when we were about to start practice, there was news that circulated. We had lost one of the key figures in the country, and they had said she was laid here at Lee. I left the church. And I went to Lee, and I got there just when some of the national leaders were coming in. And so if you go to YouTube, you will see a video of uh, His Excellency Kalonzo Musioka giving a remark, and right beside him was yours truly. Because <laughs> I love my country. I want my country to succeed. And all of it is coming from just the observance of Madaraka Day and Jamhuri Day and Moi Day. I still listen in to what the president says about where we are coming from. I, I love my country, and if you're close to me, you notice every time we get to that talk where all you're saying is how doomed our country is and how bad we are, I, most of the times you'll notice I don't engage. Too much negative energy. I need my country to prosper, and I want my country to be well. And all that is coming from a place where, as a young child, just observing these four national holidays, so much that I keep a flag of my country on my arm, even when I sleep, because I need my country to succeed. It is rare that such occasions would inspire something in most of us. 
And as important as Jamhuri Day is to the Republic of Kenya, and as important as Mashuja Day is, and all those festivities, and as important as for some of you, you, for you it's your birthday. When it's your birthday, you will take leave and plan and make reservations for a hotel in Mombasa to go and celebrate. Because this is a special day. Some of you, when it's your wedding anniversary, you plan for it. There is even a committee with a budget planning for your wedding anniversary. And yet, as important as all these celebrations are, none of it comes half as close as what this season is in the Christian faith. That as dutiful and diligent as we are in celebrating these days, yet none of it comes as half, I mean, close to any importance as to what this season is. Because some of us have a birthday today because Easter existed. And God saved you, otherwise you'd be dead. Some of you are only having a marriage anniversary today because Christ died in the first place and saved you and got you a nice woman for a wife. If you are still in the pits of drinking alcohol, you'd be the one who'd be saying, and you've gone blind. And some of us, those dates and days that are important to us are only relevant because Jesus died. And not only died, but rose again. And so if there's a season that should excite us, if there's a season that should convict us, if there's a season we should get wild over, it ought to be this season. And yet that's not the picture you get. It is in this season that our congregation shrinks. It is in this season, ironically, that our parking spaces in church are empty and the parking spots in where people go to drink and revel, they are full. In the church, in this season, numbers are shrinking. In Naivasha, there is an overflow. And it has nothing to do with the risen Lord. It has everything to do with sin. The bishop preached a message last year and said something queer happened on the way to marriage. And I submit to you today, something queer has indeed happened on the way to the commemoration of Easter. How ironic is it that we read, I read a blog post the other day that said the two seasons in the year that register the highest number of sexual misconduct and promiscuity are the Christmas period and the Easter season. How much more ironic can it get? Something queer has indeed happened. And as we reflect about these new findings, just in case you have forgotten, let me jog your memory and take you down memory line and help you understand and appreciate why this is important for us. Why this ought to be that season where we slow down everything else and redirect all the traffic in our houses and say, we are going to church. Friday is here exactly 1,991 years ago, actually. It's that close. 1,991 years ago on a Friday at 3 o'clock in the morning, our Savior is pinned on a cross. And they stretch him on this cross. There's a crowd that has come to witness and, and the disciples are perhaps hiding in this crowd and their hopes have been dashed and they did not in their finite minds anticipate this is how the story was going to end. And they watch as Jesus is impaled on this cross and they get seven inch long nails and they sink those nails on his palm through his feet and he is stretched up that cross and the Bible says the life-giving Jesus actually died. The one who brought Lazarus back to life, he died. The one who worked out miracles, restored sight to the blind, brought back the daughter of Jairus back to life, he died. And nobody saw that coming. And I'm assuming there was jubilation and joy in the pits of hell. And Jesus died, I hear Baptist preachers say, he died so good till the sun refused to shine. And if that doesn't get you, they keep on going. He died till the ground testified of his death, for there was a violent earthquake. 
I still don't have you, I'll keep going. He died till the centurion servant and the soldiers paused and said, this was truly the son of God. He died till the graves and tombs of righteous men in Jerusalem began to burst open and people started seeing their loved ones who had died. Skeletons of dead people coming back to life because Jesus died and he died so good. Oh, I dare say, he died till the temple, the veil that hung in the temple could not hold into place. It had to split down. And later on, the writer of Hebrews would say, a way was made for you and I that now, those of us that were aliens to the covenant, we've been grafted in. Because he died. And he died. And for sure, he died. He died because that was the point of the crucifixion, to kill you. And they watched in sadness and gloom as the Savior breathed his last. And they fled in terror. They went and locked themselves up in, the, in, in Joseph's house because and, and, they thought now we are next. And the sun is about to set and time is of essence here. A disciple called Joseph of, Arim, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, yes? Joseph of Arimathea, who the Bible remarks that he was a secret follower, a man of honor, a man of dignity, who sat in the Sanhedrin, in the council of the Sanhedrin, but he feared the Lord. Even in the council of the Sanhedrin, there were preserved men of God. Even in our day and time. In some of those institutions where you don't think there is an inch of godliness, I dare say, God has preserved some Josephs in there to serve his purpose. And so Joseph of Arimathea comes out in death and he goes to Pilate and, and together with Nathaniel, they request for the permission to take down the body of Jesus. And time is of essence. The sun is about to set and when the sun sets, the preparations for Sabbath will begin and nobody is expected to do anything. And so they have to do everything in a rush. So they get down the body of Jesus from the cross. They don't have time to prepare it for burial. They wrap it in a linen cloth. They carry it to a nearby tomb. And the Bible observes that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and a few other women are watching from a distance, and they are trailing with Joe and brother Nate as they carry the body of the Lord. And they follow them from the distance and watch where he would be laid. And so they drop him by this tomb and they leave and they go back to a hopeless place. And Sabbath kicks in, nothing can be done. So the women go and they begin to prepare spices so that early on Sunday morning, on the first day of the week, they can go back to the body of Jesus and now properly bury it. And they have to anoint the body because this society did not have embalming services that would allow a dead body to be preserved. And so what they would do is that they would anoint the body with oil so that it would stay longer. And so the scripture we read opens up the curtains on Sunday morning, a day like this. And the Bible says the women are on their way to the tomb. There is Mary Magdalene. There is Mary, the mother of James. There is also a lady called Salome, according to the rendering of Mark. And also John tells us there was another lady in there called Joanna. And they go to the tomb. And as they go to the tomb, they recognize there is a problem. Because on Saturday night, as Christ lay in the tomb, some of the teachers of law went to Pilate and to the high priest and they said, when this fellow was alive, he had said that on the third day, he is going to resurrect. And so we suspect that the only way that would be made possible, this is Bible, is that the disciples would come to the temple at night and steal his body. So we need you to do something to stop that from happening. And the high priest says, that's easy. We will get a stone and roll it over the tomb. And then he says, on top of the stone, place the governor's seal. Does your Bible say that? The governor's seal. And over the governor's seal, appoint soldiers to man the tomb. And this way, the disciples would not steal his body. I want you to get it right. He says, we will roll a stone. We will put a seal and we will put soldiers. 
We will roll a stone, we will put a seal, and we will appoint soldiers. They are all in S so that you easily remember. A stone, a seal, and a soldier. The stone is a problem that needs to be overcome. The seal is a power that needs to be challenged. And the soldiers are people that have to be confronted. I'll say that again. They're all in peace so that you remember. The stone is a problem. The seal is a power representing the authority of the governor. And the soldiers are people that need to be challenged. And, and, the, and, and the high priest said, by this, we will overcome them. And as the women are walking down, going to the tomb, they recognize we have a problem. And they ask themselves, who is going to help us roll the stone? And when they get there, they realize God got there before them. <laughs> when they get there, they realize God got there before them. And this is the first gospel truth, good news on Resurrection Sunday. When God is getting ready to work out a miracle, there is no problem, there is no power, and there is no person that can stand on the way of the miraculous power of God. I will say it again, when God wants to work out a miracle, not just in resurrection, even in your life today, there is no power, there is no problem, and there is no person that can stand on the way of God. Are you hearing me this morning? And I would say that this way again. Anybody who's way, making his way to us, the reason, Lord, God will open up the doors for you to access him. Anybody that's running towards Jesus today, God is committed to clearing every obstacle on your way so that you can see Jesus. There is no amount of obstacle, opposition, or discouragement that can stand on the way of what God wants to do in your life. And so the women get there and they find God beat them to it. See, the guards were representing people. You know, in, the, in the case of Jesus, this is how they thought the resurrection would happen, that they would steal the body of Jesus, and then they would say he resurrected. But that was not how it was going to go down. And there were people there that were entrusted the responsibility of making sure the life of Christ doesn't bounce back through the resurrection. It's the same with our lives. There are people, some of us are surrounded with people that are there to make sure the life of God in you does not come forth. I'm preaching to people who've given up on their God calling because of people that are there to make sure the life of God doesn't come out. I'm preaching to people who are stuck in alcohol because there is one colleague who's there to ensure you don't overcome it. I'm speaking to our people who've given up on their marriages because they have listened to some people around them that have told them how it doesn't work in this day and time. I know there are people here that have abandoned obeying God because of the people around us. And today God wants to challenge those people. He wants to challenge those mindsets and make way for the life of God within you to spring up. Today God wants to separate some of us from certain companies so that the razor... See, see Paul would later on say that same power that conquered the grave is here to give life to your bodies. But there are people sometimes around us that would become a hindrance to the fulfilling of that word. There are some of you here that should be on this pulpit preaching with me. But why are you not here? Maybe because there are some people around you. Be careful of friends that you only thrive in your friendship when you're sinning. They encourage your iniquity, but they never empower your journey towards righteousness. Beware! And some of you are in groups with them and you've called yourself divas for life. Divas for life on your way to hell. Your friendship only flows when you're sinning. 
You only have conversations when you're sinning. When you begin to bring the church language, they disappear. I want to encourage you today that those people need to be confronted. Those people need to be confronted. We need to trust the power of God to hold them back. In fact, you know the Bible says when the disciples, when these soldiers had the earthquake and the angel appeared, the Bible explains to us how they were restrained. They were held back with fear. The guards were afraid. They shook and became like dead men. It's awakufungu wakamba. It's the fear of God that held them back. I want to pray that God would do something in your life that would hold certain people back, that would hold certain individuals back, that would say, that's a child of God, don't mess with them. I pray that God would do something miraculous in your workplace, that your colleagues would be held back with the fear of God. And they said, that's a child of God, don't mess with her. Come on, God's people. I pray that God would honor you with something, a sign. That we will say to those strange women around you, stay back. That's a man of God. He doesn't speak that language. Huh? And sometimes before that miraculous things happen, you've got to be that miracle. You've got to stand and proclaim your testimony. I. My, my, my late father pastored a church, a small church in, in a place called Soe. He pastored a small church that gave him problems to death. And he did not have proper way of addressing those problems like we have here in Sita. If you hang around pastors, you'll hear once in a while when a pastor observes a certain tendency in a fellow pastor, you'll hear them being told, you need to be Pastor Wamboy's client. Because we've discovered healthier ways of dealing with problems these people bring to us. So my father didn't have proper ways of dealing with those problems, and so he died. And when he died, because we don't have a constitution in our church like we do here, there are no protocols on what happens when the pastor dies, the wife automatically had to become the pastor. <laughs> so my mother, even without being approached by any committee or deacons board or elders council, we all knew she was going to be a pastor on her inaugural service as the pastor of this small local church, Abandoned Faith Church in Soy, Msalabayelo, um, Soy Sublocation, Likuyani Sub County, Kakamega County, on your way to Kitale from Eldoret on the left side of the highway. <laughs> My own dear mother, the Pastor Jane, stands on the congregation and her maiden speech. She says, I am a wounded lioness. I said, okay, what a way to start. <laughs> and she says, I know how some of you treated my husband, but that's going to change. I'm like, hey, you know, sometimes I wish I had half the guts my mother has. <laughs> my ministry would be far. <laughs> oh, bless her soul. I love that woman. She's amazing. She stands before this congregation and she says, it's going to be different because there's a new sheriff in town. And then she goes on and she says, and because I know you personally, it's one of two ways. You either shape in or shape out. And I'm like, yo, you need the offering after the service. Take it easy. But she says, you either shape in or shape out. And someone is over. My sisters are here, I can see them laughing. Ask them, they'll tell you. Because we were all in that service. Nine months down the line, for the first time, in 15 years, that church is almost as old as I am. In nine months after my father's death, we built a permanent church, which my father had tried to build all his life. But there was always a Tobias and a Sanballat in that congregation that always said, this cannot happen. We are giving too much money. But somebody stood and challenged those people and said, you either shape in or shape out. And today there is a congregation that has busted into life because somebody dared challenge the people. And today I want to give you the opportunity and the permission to go and preach to those people the gospel according to Pastor Cole's mom. And say to them, listen, we've been good friends. 
I've enjoyed the ride. But at this point, if you're not giving life to the life of God in my life, you have one of two options. You either shape in or shape out. And watch God do his thing. We cannot afford to sacrifice the work of God in our lives because of some guards. Somebody today has to arise in that family meeting and say to that uncle, with all due respect, uncle so-and-so. Though they say when you start a statement with all due respect, there's no respect coming. (laughs) But somebody has to be told anyway. Somebody has got to confront that auntie. That's the reason why your marriage can't enjoy peace. Because you've listened to them, you've empowered them. Somebody must confront someone today. Somebody has to go back to their places of work on Tuesday and say, excuse me, colleagues, something has changed. Powers must be confronted. People must be confronted. Number two was the seal. The seal was representing the governor's authority. The seal was representing the power. And Jesus dealt with it. Powers that say it cannot be you. Structures that say, not you. Systems that have been designed to choke the life of God out of church. Laws and legislations that are there to make sure the church is not what it should be. I want to announce today that God is challenging all those powers, not just for the church, but even in your life. Haven't you read in scripture that we wrestle not against flesh and blood? Ephesians 6, 12, but against powers and principalities. When you come for counseling, we hear you say sometimes, Pastor, I suspect there's a curse that has been spoken. Listen, see, the authority of the governor, they thought the governor's authority would limit the power of the resurrection. They got the order wrong. It's like getting a grenade and taking away the safety pin and to prevent the explosion, you look for cello tape. And you wrap this grenade in cello tape and begin to walk around with it. It shall not explode. Yo, the power in that grenade cannot be contained by cello tape. It shall explode with you. You missed a good place to say amen. amen. See, they got the order wrong. Pilate's authority cannot restrain the authority of our Lord. It's the other way around. When I was in high school, I was a school captain. And I was a school captain um, of a wonderful school called Wasingishu High School in Eldoret. I was the fa- when I became the school captain, they changed the title to school president. And I started walking in power. And I had a, that time we were calling her prime minister. Her name is Winnie Simiu. She's a, she's a pastor. You see? That was a good school. She's, she's doing ministry somewhere in Kakamega. And so I was happy to be a president. I would walk around excited about that title. So one of the things I used to do was every time we are nearing the close of a term, it was my responsibility to go to all heads of department, head of department, math, bio, languages, humanities, and ask them to prepare articles which we would in, um, incorporate in our newsletter so that the students can take it to the parents. So because we were in an exam period, I thought a way of making it easier so that I don't waste time going to over every office. Excuse me, Mark, can you prepare? I decided to write what is called a memo. (laughs) And I said, uh, memo to heads of department from the school president. (laughs) Reference, request for end of term Briefings, you are requested to prepare. And the language was that of a president. And I called members of my cabinet, we used to call them Pentagon, and I said, help help me dispatch these letters to the relevant offices. And they took the letters into every HOD's office. I took a few, stamped them on the notice boards around school, and I went to class. Brothers and sisters, A few moments later, (laughs) when those letters landed to the offices, it wasn't business as usual. The heads of department quickly converged in staff room without an agenda. 
And they were all asking one question. Who does he think he is? <laughs> I was in class preparing for an exam. Uh, my English teacher who was doing teaching practice that time, his name is Mr. Mbogo. Mr. Mbogo came and said, Precious. And he took me aside and he said, if you know what's good for you, go home now. <laughs> I didn't know that there is an order and a hierarchy in which memos are written. I didn't know that memos are written downwards, not upwards. Authority is delegated. I got the order wrong and that memo was null and void like hot air. And that's exactly what the governor's seal was in light of who was lying in the tomb. They got the order wrong. See, let me encourage someone. It doesn't matter who has gone to what which doctor. They have the order wrong. It doesn't matter who has pronounced what curse. They got the order wrong. Listen, it doesn't matter who is crafting what law. They have the order wrong. There is no authority. There is no power. There is no structure. There is no order. There is no decree that can stop the life of God within you from coming to life. I wish I had witnesses in this service. So I empower you today. Oh, it should be the Holy Spirit empowering you, not me. To go and challenge those powers. To go and stand in the might of the Lord. And declare to every declaration that the life of God in your marriage shall spring back to life. The life of God in your walk with God shall spring back to life in the name of Jesus. Come on, if you believe it, say a big amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there was an obstacle, because if you're not dealing with people, and if you're not dealing with the power, you're dealing with an obstacle. You're dealing with a sickness. You're dealing with a financial situation. You're dealing with man-made problems. And in as much as Mary, the two Marys and Salome and Joanna are aware that these obstacles are on their way, they still go. And so I came to tell someone, walk, still go. Keep going. That's the only way you discover he beat you to it. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Doesn't matter what obstacle is standing on your way. It doesn't matter what problem is standing on your way. It doesn't matter what power or what person is standing on your way. You soldier on anyway. Are you hearing me? Yes. Soldier on anyway. Desire to see tomorrow anyway. That's the only way you meet him before you. And they went there, and indeed, Christ was risen. In conclusion, when they got there, an angel communicates to them, and he says, he's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Go and tell his disciples. Are you with me? Are you with me? Go and tell his disciples. The soldiers run to the governor and to Pilate, and they say, they give an account of what happened. And the governor says, this is how we're going to handle that situation. Go around town and say his disciples came at night and stole his body. So 1990, 1991 years ago today, this very morning, this very moment, there are two reports emanating from the graveyard. The soldiers are saying the disciples stole his body. The women are saying he's risen. And the society then is put in a conflict as we are today on whose report do you believe? <laughs> the disappointment with the report of the resurrection is that it is coming from sources that were not credited. Because this is a society that was patriarchal in nature. Women didn't have a place, but they are the ones saying his reason and a choice has to be made then and now. This is not a gray situation. It's black or white. You and I must come to the place where we make a decision. Is he risen or not? 
And Paul would speak in 1 Corinthians 15 and say, if Christ did not rise from the dead, we are a bunch of hopeless people. What we are doing is futile. This is useless. We are miserable. We would rather close down Sitam Valley Road and go back to our sinful ways to hell. So whose report shall you believe? I will give you in brief three irrefutable proofs that he truly is risen. So that next year, a time like this, you will bring your neighbors to church because you believe he truly is risen. When the, dis- when the women tell the disciples that Jesus has risen according to the rendering of John, we read that Peter and another unnamed disciple, they took off to the tomb. Why? Because the easiest way to know whether he's risen or not is to go and see if his body is there. True or not true? They take off. The Bible, in fact, says the other disciple outran Peter. And this is really funny to imagine. Imagine old men tucking their cloak. He outruns Peter, gets to the tomb, and the Bible says he doesn't go in. He watches from the door. Praise God for Peter. He comes to the inside, and he doesn't find a body. Friends, one of the easiest ways to settle the debate on whether Jesus rose or not is just give proof for his dead body. Can you imagine the shame and humiliation and the defeat 2,000 years of Christianity would experience if that body was to be produced? With all the scientific ability at the disposal of Satan and atheists and all haters of God, why haven't they found the body? We have evidence of the tomb of Caiaphas, as Yoerika Gutam Seveni, His Excellency, calls him. He calls him Kayafa. Caiaphas. We have evidence of the tomb of Caiaphas. We have found the Atlantic on the, uh, we found the Titanic on the bot- bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. We have found remains of the city of Pompeii after years of being buried under volcanic ash. We have evidence of life in the days of Australopithecus and Zingathropus and Homo habilis and Homo sapiens. We have found the Roman Colosseum where the amphitheater where people, believers used to be killed. Why hasn't anybody found the body of Jesus? Why? We, we, we even here, we have discovered Jericho. After 430 years of slavery in Egypt, somehow the bones of Joseph were still found. Why hasn't anybody produced the dead body of our Lord Jesus Christ? It's really not a spiritual matter. It's simple. Let's not complicate it. It's simply because he rose. There's no dead body. Otherwise, that would have been the first agenda of Satan. So how I know the proof of his resurrection is that his body is no longer in the grave. That grave is now a historic site for you and I to go and walk in and reckon that our Savior rose from the dead. The missing body of Christ. Evidence number two. Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5, and he gives us an itinerary. Is that what it's called? Is, is it called itin- iti? itinerary? That one. We didn't study that in Lumino Primary School. <laughs> he gives us an itinerary of Jesus, and he says, first, he appeared to Cephas, Peter. Then, he appeared to the 12 disciples. Then, he appeared to 500 at once. Are you with me? And then he appeared to James. Then he appeared to all the apostles. And then lastly, he appeared to me. Notice, first he appeared to Peter. Then he appeared to the 12. Then he appeared to 500 men at once. Then he appeared to James. Then he appeared to the apostles. And finally, he appeared to me. So all the disciples and the apostles saw Jesus risen from the dead, and yet every one of them died a painful death when all they would have said is, 
he did not rise. They all suffered a horrendous death. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. Who is crucified on an X-shaped cross for a lie? A lie doesn't hold truth, especially when punishment is in sight. When we were in high school, we would do mischief. And we would go out there and we'd say, Tunakufa pamoja. Apa tunakufa ki wanaume. I hope I couldn't snitch. Squeeze when it was snakes. The moment the teacher shows up and you see the size of the cane, somebody always flips. Even in your family, when you come home and find there has been some mischief, you know there's always that one child who will confess when they realize there's reality of punishment. Someone will say, okay, watch and say ukweli. Of all of the apostles, nobody flips. Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't find himself worthy to die the same way Christ died. Who is crucified upside down for a lie? Thomas was speared to death. He would have preserved his life by simply saying, it's a lie. He didn't rise. But he says, I would rather die than confess not seeing him. Yet I saw him with my own eyes. John the apostle was dropped in hot oil. Imagine a hot boy, hot oil burning in a, in a huge pan and they grab John and they say, there's only one way out. Just confess and John says, I would rather die in this hot oil than refuse and deny a truth. And as he's dropped in, when you go home, I know some of you are going to make some fried chips and some nice potato wages and some nice vegetables. Why don't you try to drop in your finger on that hot oil? And see just how convenient it was for Paul. Paul said, I would rather roast in this oil than deny a truth I saw. They all suffered a horrendous death. Peter is being stoned outside of Jerusalem. And he lifts up his eyes and he says, I see my Savior on the right side of the Father. Jesus, receive me from heaven. How do I know he's risen? The disciples and the apostles opted to die than live in a lie. He's dusting in oil. But here we are convenient with our Christianity, denying him every day in our actions. May we never lose the wonder of the cross. The third and last evidence about his resurrection and here, a number of you are captured in. It's presented to us in a man who was a Pharisee, a hater of God, born in Bethlehem, fully Jew, circumcised on the eighth day from the tribe of Benjamin, a man who received his training under Gamaliel. We are first introduced to him in Acts chapter 7 as a small boy. And when Stephen had been trialed and found guilty, he was sentenced to go and be stoned outside of the city. And when the men of Jerusalem escort Stephen outside of the city to stone him, the Bible says in Acts chapter 7, towards the very end, that as the men remove their coats so that they can be comfortable to stone Stephen, they hand their coat to a little brother called Saul. He's the one they trust to keep their property safe. And Saul watches them as they stone Stephen to death. He becomes inspired by that act that in Acts chapter 8, he makes it his ambition to fight Christ. He makes it his ambition to persecute believers. And on Acts chapter 9, we read of him on the route to Damascus. And he encounters the risen Lord. And there is a transformation that ensues. And in Acts chapter 9, Paul is converted. He is convicted. He is converted. And he is commissioned to preach the gospel. There is a flip. So much so that in Acts chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, when he goes to the disciples, the disciples don't believe him. And they said, no, your application to join the membership has been declined. And the only way he proves this point is by preaching the gospel. How do I know he is alive? Because his transforming power 
is not only present and visible in the act of a Pharisee or in the life of a Pharisee that has been turned a disciple, I also have here people that have been transformed by that same power. Seated next to you is a man and woman that was deep in sin. Don't, look, don't let the suit lie to you. That guy used to get drunk and pee on themselves. Don't let that nice beard tree. That guy was a... Do I have people that know they have been transformed by the power of God? Are there people in this congregation that can say with me, the person I was, I'm not that anymore. The places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. And it's not just because I was dissatisfied, but I met the transforming power of God. How do I know he's alive? Every Sunday I witness his transforming power at work here. I still see men come to the Lord. I still see lives being changed. I still see drunkards abandoning the drink and running to the altar. And that's how I know that Jesus is risen. And brothers and sisters, if you ever doubted the resurrection power, you, you, you can doubt the missing body because you'll say you weren't there. You can doubt the apostles died a horrific death because you'd say you're not there, but you cannot doubt your transformation. And that there is the evidence on this Resurrection Sunday that he is risen. And I want to proclaim in the name of Jesus, may he bring back to life every dead area in your life in the name of Jesus. I want to proclaim today that may that same power that conquered the grave empower you to rise up one more time in your life. Come on, if you believe me, why don't you stand up and give the Lord praise? Come on, why don't we just fill this room with worship? Come on, go ahead. Let's praise him. Let's give him praise. Let's give him praise. Come on, sit on Valley Road. He's risen. I said he's risen. Let's give him a shout of praise. Come on, let's go ahead and praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. I said praise him. I said praise him. Come on, let's praise him. Let's praise him today. For he is risen. He is risen. He lives. Come on, put your hands together. Let's just adore him in a moment. Let's adore him. Let's declare he lives. Let's declare he reigns. Let's declare he's alive. Let's declare he's alive. He's no longer in the grave. Go ahead and proclaim over your life that every area of deadness is springing back to life. Come on, praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Let's give him praise. Come on, sit on Valley Road. Yasha nana masita la rabasia. Yekata la rabababa sheka. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Our Savior. He's alive. He's no longer in the grave. Oh, shala ramasia. Pilot could not stop him. The seal could not restrain him. The guards could not contain him. For he is reason. For he is reason. I said he's reason. I said he's reason. Jesus is alive this morning. Come on, I see the life of God come upon someone. I see the life of God lifting up someone from a place of hopelessness. I see him lifting you up from a struggle. I see him challenging powers that have held you back over the years. I see him. I see him. He's here today. He's here today. He's here this moment. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah! Our Savior is alive. Our Savior is alive. Hallelujah! As we bring this service to an end, are you here this morning? And this life of God has never been awakened in your life. And you're saying, Pastor, I want to be part of this experience. I want to pray with someone who wants to commit their heart to the Lord. And allow the risen Lord and Savior, our resurrected reigning and soon to come redeemer to come into your heart. If that's you, can I just see your hand? Can I just see your hand? Are you there? You want to get born again today to allow Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior. Is there anyone like that near you? If you can see anybody near you, anybody like that, saying, I open up my heart this morning for the Lord to come in. Do we have anyone? This life wants to give you life today. Our risen Lord wants to separate you from sinful patterns in your life. If that's you, just stretch up your hand. I will see it and we'll pray together. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord. May we never lose the wonder of the cross. We thank you because there is a fountain filled with blood flowing from Emmanuel's veins. And Lord, when sin has plunged beneath that stream, they lose all their guilty stain. Thank you that today, like the dying thief on the cross, he rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And we rejoice today here in Sitam Valley Road because we have seen that fountain. And there may we, though vile as he, lose all our guilty stain. We pray that your redeeming love will keep us from falling that the power of the resurrected King would bring to life every area of deadness in our lives. And we thank you. And we give you a shout of praise as we clap our hands to you. In Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. Come on, give him praise until our senior pastor is here. Let's appreciate the Lord one more time.